go into the world. And tell every man that you meet, there is a man on the cross. A Catholic take. What you need to know right now. A bold synthesis of inspiration and information. Keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous Catholic perspective. A Catholic Take with Joe McLean starts now. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It's great to be on with you. Praise be to God. It is going to be a great show today. Let's talk about Fulton Sheen and the connection with Our Lady of Guadalupe, the end times with Dr. Peter Howard from the Fulton Sheen Institute. It's going to be on at 30 past the hour. I mean, there isn't fa- he's got a fascinating theory on the connection between these things. I'm really going to, I'm going to enjoy this big time today. So stick around 30 past the hour. Plus he's going to be in the after show for an extended conversation with Dr. Peter Howard coming up on the program today. But uh, I don't know if you caught this, or I'm actually going to be linking to a little video clip of Miss Kamala Harris. Uh, boy, but she really wants to implement the full breadth, width and depth and the power and the might of the justice department to control the narrative. She doesn't want people like, say, me, for instance, being able to say the things that I do and get away with it. She wants to hold a lot of people accountable in her next four years in office. Also on the table is George Soros taking over 200 plus radio stations and the FCC warp speeding this thing. Thanks, Donald Trump, for setting the precedent. Warp speeding this thing past security because it's a lot of foreign investment going here, going on here. Just in time for the elections, we're going to get attorney Brent Haynes on the program at 14 past the hour to talk about the controlling narrative that we're seeing. Oh, but the, the hits don't stop there. Did you catch that the world, the union, the United uh, Nations, the UN, they adopted the pact for the future. Did you read that document? I've been through portions of this document. And let me just say uh, one world government is definitely on the agenda. So we've got a lot to get to today. We're going to be linking to the show notes for you over at the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. And by the way, breaking news, uh, New York City Mayor Eric Adams has been indicted. The first sitting New York City mayor to ever face criminal charges. Boy, do we live in fun and interesting times. Don't you agree? Let's pray. Let's get into it. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come. Before thee I stand sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And now your saint of the day. The North American Martyrs, pray for us. In the mid-16th century, eight French Jesuit missionaries were martyred at the hands of the Iroquois. Father Isaac Jogues and lay brother René Goupil were captured in the year of our Lord 1642. And after the two underwent horrible ritual tortures, brother René was killed with a tomahawk near what is now Orisville, New York, the site of a great shrine and pilgrimage honoring the martyrs. Father Isaac was ransomed back to France, but soon returned and resumed his work. He and lay brother Jean de Lalande were captured, beaten, and killed at Orisville in the year of our Lord 1646. The rest of the martyrs died in what is now Ontario, Canada. Father Antoine Daniel was killed during an Iroquois raid in 1648. The next year, Father Charles Garnier was killed in a similar raid, and Father Noel Chabanel was murdered by an apostate Iroquois. Earlier that same year, Father Jean de Brebeuf, the Apostle of the Hurons, and his assistant, Father Gabriel Lalemane, were taken prisoner in another raid. After undergoing horrifying, barbaric tortures, the two were finally put to death and then cannibalized. The North American martyrs are also celebrated on October 19th in the modern calendar. For more about this day and others in the Church's calendar, visit thestationofthecross.com slash saintsandseasons. North American martyrs, Pray for us. And now your headline news. The Hill reports China test fires ICBM into international waters. 
China test-fired an intercontinental ballistic missile Wednesday morning into the Pacific, marking the first known Chinese test into international waters in four decades. The Chinese Ministry of National Defense said in a brief statement that the missile was carrying a dummy warhead when it landed in the Pacific. The statement reads, quote, This test launch is a routine arrangement in our annual training plan. It is in line with international law and international practice and is not directed against any country or target, close quote. But a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace said that the description of the specific test as routine and annual seems odd, given the fact that neither routine or annual apply here since it's been since 1980 when they last launched a missile. A Breitbart reports judge to approve auctions liquidating Alex Jones's Infowars Alex Jones's InfoWars media platform and its assets will be sold off piece by piece in auctions this fall to help pay the more than $1 billion he owes relatives of the victims of Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting under an order expected to be approved by a federal judge. Despite the pending loss of his company, Jones vows to continue his talk show through other means, possibly including a new website or his personal social media accounts. He has also suggested that InfoWars assets could be bought by his supporters, allowing him to continue on as an employee. And Catholic Vote is reporting a diocese rejects gender ideology in Catholic schools. Praise be to God, this is good news indeed. Bishop Kevin Rhodes of Fort Wayne, South Bend, Indiana, this week released guidelines for all Catholic schools in his diocese, ensuring that all policies align with the church's teaching on sexuality. In the guidelines, Rhodes rejected so-called gender ideology, affirming that sexual differences are from God and that there are only two sexes, male and female, and that the sexual identity of the human body cannot be changed. Yea and amen. And those, those are your headline news. The gospel today comes to us from Luke chapter 9, verses 7 through 9. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard of all things that were done by him, and he was in doubt because it was said by some that John was risen from the dead, but by others that Elias had appeared, and by still others that one of the old prophets was risen again. And Herod said, John I have beheaded, but who is this of whom I hear such things? And he sought to see him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The Ignatius Catholic Study Bible today would say Herod the Tetrarch, the uh, the Antipas, he was ruler of Galilee from about 4 or 1 BC to about AD 39. Catholic Commentary on Holy Scripture said the indication given in uh, verse 6, which by the way, verse 6 read, and going out... They went about through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. So sending the apostles to preach the good news has created an uproar. But so the indication given in verse 6 is sufficient to explain the stir that would naturally be caused through Galilee and disturb Herod, whose perplexity would be better accounted for if Luke had not omitted the fact that John was beheaded. So Luke's, Luke's gospel does not include that. You'd have to go to, to Mark's gospel for that. The great commentary of Cornelius Alapide actually points out that there's precedent in the rising uh, someone from the dead says one of the old prophets was risen again as Enoch and Elias will rise again before the end of all things to resist the Antichrist in like manner as Peter, Bishop and Martyr, the son of Uriah, the prophet in, Jer- in Jeremiah twenty six twenty was recalled to life by St. James, the apostle and ordained first bishop in Braga 600 years after he died. Oof, let that sink in. Cornelius Lapidae, bring in the heat. Father Haydock would write back in the 19th century, Herod was perplexed and in suspense about the report that it was John that was risen from the dead. From this, it appears that some of the Jews and Herod himself believed in some kind of uh, metempsychosis or transmigration of souls. In other words, taking a soul from one person and putting that soul into another person, kind of like Hollywood likes to put out every so often. 
Josephus says the Pharisees believed the soul to be immortal and after death to depart to some subterraneous places where they received the recompense of good or evil according to their actions. There, the souls of the wicked remain forever without the power of departing thence. The souls of the good sometimes returned and entered other bodies. Herod probably thought that the soul of John the Baptist was united to that of Christ in the same body and was thence enabled to perform new and more extraordinary functions. Such such were the reveries of some of the ra- of the rabbins or the rabbis who as St Jerome remarks abused the passages of the gospel we are now explaining in support of the path- pathogerian doctrine most of the jews believe the true doctrine of the resurrection vis-a-vis that of the body which must one day be renewed to life by the same soul which now animates it and this is the doctrine of the faith of the church which he teaches you from both the Old and New Testament. We do not believe in this this metempsychosis, this transmigration. We do not believe in, in, in reincarnation. This is all fake and false news. But don't tell that to Kamala Harris. She may, she may prosecute you. I'm just saying. We're going to cover some of that coming up here in just a moment. But as St. Paul said, it is meant for us to die once. Then you are judged. You're going to be resurrected. You're going to get your body back. Some to hell forever and the torments and the fire and some to eternal life. Too few find the path to eternal life and too many find the wide road to hell and perdition forever. Pray and meditate. We'll be right back. Jesus Christ, welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McClain. Praise be to God. Hey, coming up at 30 past the hour, Dr. Peter Howard is going to be our guest. We're going to be talking about the link between Fulton Sheen and Our Lady of Guadalupe. The year 2031 is fast approaching. Are there links? What does Fulton Sheen believe about the end times, especially when it comes to Our Lady of Guadalupe? We're going to have that conversation with Dr. Peter Howard of the Fulton Sheen Institute coming up at 30 past the hour. Do join us for that if you can. But there are lots of stories in the news that are of great concern to me, and I'm sure they are to you as well. Did you catch Vice President Kamala Harris talking about what she plans to do with the Justice Department should she win the office of presidency? Have a listen. And we'll put the Department of Justice of the United States back in the business of justice. We will double the Civil Rights Division and direct law enforcement to counter this extremism. We will hold social media platforms accountable for the hate infiltrating their platforms because they have a responsibility to help fight against this threat to our democracy. And if you profit off of hate, if you act as a megaphone for misinformation or cyber warfare, if you don't police your platforms, we are going to hold you accountable as a community. Ooh, let that sink in. Here to join us and to discuss this is our good friend, attorney, Catholic freedom fighter, Brent Taines. Brent, good morning to you. Thanks for being on the team. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, everyone. Boy, strong words from uh, Vice President Kamala Harris. She wants to use the full weight and breadth and depth of the Justice Department to stop misinformation. Here's the question. Who gets to decide what is and what is not misinformation? Well, Joe, that's exactly the problem, of course. Um, Is it uh, misinformation to say, as Donald Trump said during his presidential debate, which we talked about previously on this program, although he used overheated rhetoric, is it misinformation to say, that under Governor Tim Walz, at least eight babies who survived abortions were executed. Now, executed is overheated rhetoric, um, or at least, it, you know, it's uh, rhetoric. You know, it's attention-getting rhetoric. But there's no doubt that according to the state records of the government led by Tim Walz as governor of Minnesota, that eight babies who survived abortion died without any medical care. Two or three of them received comfort care, and many or most you know, would have probably died because of their grievous medical situation. But is it disinformation to talk about that, Joe? 
Are we only allowed right. to talk about that in a certain manner? Uh, that's that's the problem with attacks on disinformation. Nobody nobody agrees that uh, you know we should go around spreading lies. Nobody agrees that we should go around defaming people. But the question is, who gets to decide? And Kamala Harris's statement would have been shocking 25 years ago. And what is shocking now to those of us who care about free speech is that it is exactly the opposite. This is nothing new. We've spoken on this program before how even Mark Zuckerberg, the founder and creator of Facebook, now called Meta, acknowledged only a few months ago that the federal government leaned on Facebook and other social media organizations, or at least on Facebook, to censor social media posts during yeah. COVID and in other instances. And he admitted that they did it, and he says that he regrets it. We have seen it in the past questions about the operations of SISA. That's the federal agency that is supposed to be uh, guarding our cybersecurity and infrastructure. That's what it stands for, cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency. Remember the woman who came out with the Mary Poppins theme song? You know, sure. where she changed yeah. the lyrics? Well, now there's an article out that's available on the Federalist that Congressman Jim Jordan, and remember, the Republicans lose con- control of Congress. We don't get investigations like this anymore because the Democrats won't do it. Uh, Congressman Jim Jordan sent a letter to the director of SISA, and he asked about SISA exercising uh, censorship in conjunction with Democrats. And according to this report, four times the head of SISA, the director, refused to answer the question. He said this, the allegation is, quote, SISA is again reportedly, notice again, reportedly working with Democratic-led states to censor election-related speech in the lead-up to the 2024 presidential election. And Kamala Harris chose the perfect running mate for her woke views with Tim Walls, because what does Tim Walls have to say about uh, free speech? Just last month, he said there's no guarantee to free speech as to hate speech or to uh, misinformation that we need to push back and that there's no guarantee. The First Amendment does not guarantee misinformation about democracy. First of all, that is just a completely uneducated, uninformed, factually wrong point of view. You might think that misinformation should not be allowed. You might think that you have to somehow protect speech about democracy, but that is not what the Constitution says. That is not what the Supreme Court has ever said in more than 200 years. In fact, any law student, anybody who's taken a class in political science, anybody who's taken even a decent class in civics at the high school level knows that the courts and have always protected and the founders always intended with the First Amendment, with the First Amendment free speech provision to protect what is called core political speech. Mm. And this and th- this is what Tim Wall said. We have, so for a vice presidential nominee, the man who could very well be the vice president of the United States next, along with Kamala Harris's statement, but for them to say that they're not going to put up with misinformation, that they're going to push back, that they're going to, to use the popular term of the day, weaponize the Department of Justice against people who engage in what they consider misinformation – about politics and around democracy, that's dangerous. And Joe, it's not just, do you think they're going to stop on social media? No, No. they're going to come after people who say things such as abortion is the killing of an innocent child. They're going to come after people who harm transgender people and defame them. They're going to come after people like you, Joe. Oh, I know. They're going to come after stations like Station of the Cross. Well, here, why- let me put this log on the fire for you real quick. World leaders adopt piv- pivotal U.N. pact for the future. Uh, the United Nations over the weekend, they adopted the resolutions for the pact for the future. In fact, the Cardinal Secretary of State, Cardinal Pierre Pietrelin, I'm going to cover the story in the news next segment. But uh, even he was there to address some of the issues of abortion and other things. I've downloaded and looked through that document, uh, Brent. 
There is a number of issues in this document that are incredibly concerning, but they are wanting to uh, sort of get all world governments on the same page when it comes to Agenda 2030, DEI, gender equality, uh, climate change issues. They're they're ramping things up. And the United States is definitely on board with that. And Kamala Harris, you know, sort of signaling the use of the Justice Department is only echoing what, say, Brazil has been doing with uh, with uh, Twitter and X most recently. But I'm also very concerned about what George Soros is up to and the fact that the FCC, again, the Democrats and the on the committee for the FCC, lightning speed approval, negating the security checks that are necessary to ensure that foreign entities, foreign money is not going to be adversely impacting Uh, our American citizenry, but now 200 plus radio stations of talk radio listeners are going to be subjected to whatever George Soros wants to cram down their throats over the next few months before the election. Golly gee whiz, what could go wrong? Brent Haynes. Well, two points about that acquisition by George Soros and his group of for over 200 radio stations. First of all, there is a limit to the foreign ownership that is allowed for uh, radio stations. The limit is supposed to be 25%. That is in federal law. Apparently, according to the news report, Soros' own documents, and according to a commission on the FCC, as this comes down to the Federal Communications Commission, according to one of the Republican commissioners, Soros' own documents uh, confirm that there's greater than a 25% foreign interest. So there's your first legal problem. Second, there's supposed to be a national security review. A national security review because information is so important and they're bypassing the national security review they are taking as one abc headline says george soros taking quote shortcut end quote to buy 200 u.s radio stations fcc commissioner says uh, uh, quoting that republican commissioner uh, the federal communications commission has five commissioners right now there are three democrats there are two republicans and they voted in a party line vote to allow allow george soros to take over these radio stations now why why do we care when radio is a dying medium, because conservative talk programs have historically thrived on the radio. That's how Rush Limbaugh got his start. Do you remember Rush Limbaugh? Oh, yeah, the king of talk radio. And remember how he became a national phenomenon? That's where Sean Hannity has a lot of his programs from Fox News. Sean Hannity is probably best known these days for his evening talk show on Fox News. But he started in radio, and he, he works very hard. He spends all day on the radio, and then he spends all night on TV. Uh, Sean Hannity is on these programs, uh, on these radio stations. Other conservatives are on these uh, radio stations, such as Glenn Beck. Do you think that George Soros and his even more politically oriented right. son, who now taking right. over his political empire, do you think he's going to let those radio stations continue? No way. So, Joe, why are they taking a shortcut? Why are they rushing this? Why are they doing it right before an election? Why aren't they following the law? They this tried this problem. before, though. They did try this before in the past with uh, was it was it Air Air America or something like that. The there was a, a network of radio stations that tried to introduce liberal or Democrats in talk radio, and it failed, failed miserably. In fact, uh, my previous Catholic radio apostolate ended up buying a few of those stations after their failure. So, tr- like going back, like you say, the talk radio listener tends to be more conservative, and in the past when they've tried to. You know, censor that it has failed, but it seems to me that there is a new vigor to control the narrative, to control the message, and they're going to include the Justice Department in that agenda if they should win uh, the White House in the next four years. Do you think it'll get very serious, or is this just more campaign rhetoric? Well, look at what they've already done with SISA. Look at look at what what Miss Mary Poppins, the former executive director, of, the former director of SISA, did. Uh, look what the federal government has already done with Facebook and the other social media. Remember, there's what's really, really uh, uh, alarming, what's really, really upsetting and disturbing, especially to me as a lawyer, is this issue went up to the United States Supreme Court. And just earlier this year, they actually ruled in favor of the federal government. Now, they didn't rule on the merits. They said people didn't have standing. But I don't see the rationale there because one of the people who was a plaintiff was a Facebook person who had her, her post met, censored. And the, and the Supreme Court said, no, the federal government can talk to the social media companies and you know, they have a message, and et cetera. No, the Supreme Court should have come down and said, no, 
you can't the federal government cannot use its so-called persuasive authority to get other private entities to do what the federal government is not allowed to do. That's what's alarming. We've seen what they've done with SISA. Look, when Tim Wolf says there's no uh, free speech about political democracy, believe him. When Paula Harris says believe him. Department of Justice, believe her. Exactly. Exactly. Believe. Believe what they're telling you because they believe it too. And boy, oh boy, is it going to be. Is it going to be a harsh reality one day when we wake up and realize what we have done? Hey, Brent Haynes, thanks for your insight. Thanks for bringing these stories to our awareness because nobody else is really talking about them. And boy, it needs to be talked about. We'll put links in the description over at the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT in our show notes section. Sign up there. But coming up after the break, let's talk about the venerable Fulton Sheen and the connection to Our Lady of Guadalupe with Dr. Peter Howard. All that and more is coming up next. Don't go anywhere. Hi, Joe McClain here, host of A Catholic Take, and I am so grateful that you are on our team. This program, A Catholic Take, and all of our programs that we produce at the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network would not be possible if it wasn't for your financial contribution and your prayers. Right now, we are in the middle of our 2024 fall appeal. The theme is celebrating 25 years. Can you believe it? It's been 25 years since Mother Angelica motivated Jim and Joanne Wright to put their heart in the same place that their passion was. And they formed and founded this apostolate. And here we are 25 years later. But we need your financial contribution to keep going. We're going to be on the air September the 30th through October 4th. And we want your generous support. Whatever God puts on your heart, it's going to mean the world to us. Now, you can return that through the envelope that we mailed to you on our website, thestationofthecross.com, or by calling in when we're live on air. God love you. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McClain, and it's great to be on with you here at your headline news Catholic News Agency is reporting Vatican Secretary of State calls out UN for promoting abortion and gender ideology. In an address to the United Nations Summit of the Future in New York, Cardinal Pietro Perelin, the Holy See's Secretary of State, voiced the Vatican's concern with a document titled Pact for the Future, which was passed by the summit attendees on Sunday. Though praising the summit attendees for engaging in dialogue, Perelin commented that there is a need to rethink actions in a number of areas. He said, in conformity with its nature and particular mission, the Holy See wishes to express its reservations regarding the Assembly's promotion of abortion and gender ideology. Reservations. Maybe we should use a wee bit stronger language. And also, by the way, they want world government control and power. Just check out bullet point 82 in their new document. Anyway, the Blaze reports Trump says Iran has tried to assassinate him. Donald Trump revealed Tuesday that the Iranian government has allegedly tried to assassinate him and security has been increased as a result. The Trump campaign also said in a statement that the former president had been briefed by the office of the director of national intelligence about the threat meant to destabilize and sow chaos in the United States. The campaign went on to say that the threat had heightened in the past few months. Also, it was revealed yesterday that Secret Service was informed about the July 13 shooter Matthew Crooks a full 27 minutes before shots were fired in Butler, PA. And still, Trump was not taken off stage. And Catholic Vote is reporting San Diego homeschool groups are banned from meetings at parishes. The Diocese of San Diego has banned homeschooling groups from meetings on its properties. A new policy in the Diocesan Handbook states, quote, The use of parish facilities by charter schools, homeschool programs, or private school programs is prohibited, both because such usage can undermine the stability of nearby Catholic schools and lead people to think that the church is approving and advancing particular alternative schools and programs, close quote. Yikes. Let that sink in for a moment. You have choices as parents. Choose wisely. Homeschooling is amazing. Those are your headline news. Hey, uh, check it out. I I am absolutely in love with Archbishop Fulton Sheen, as most people are, I think, right? I mean, we just, we love his 
timely message, the way he delivers it. It's captivating. It's interesting. His writing is powerful and clear, and it's always very, very good. And if you've studied anything about the end times and what Fulton Sheen has to say, you're further captivated. In fact, recently I interviewed on a book on the on Fulton Sheen's views on the demonic, which sort of touches on this. But Dr. Peter Howard over at the Fulton Sheen Institute, we're going to put a link to it in the uh, in the show notes, FultonSheen.Institute. We'll put a link to it in the show notes today. He has said some amazing things linking uh, Archbishop Fulton Sheen to Our Lady of Guadalupe that I find utterly fascinating. And he joins us now to talk about that. Good morning to you, Dr. Peter Howard. Good morning, Joe. Great to be with you. Praise be to God. Um, let's talk about Fulton Sheen. We all love him. I, I mean, if we had longer time, maybe in the after show, we could talk about maybe sort of towards the end of his life. And there was some issues there. But but at the end of the day, most Catholics are drawn to him like like moths to a light. He's just so captivating. But when you talked about the connection between Fulton Sheen and Lady Guadalupe, my mind was blown. Tell me about that. What is the connection to Fulton Sheen and Our Lady Guadalupe? Sure. Well, it's something that came to my mind, gosh, probably a few years ago, especially in light of um, his beatification that never was. And the feast day that was chosen, as well as the the, uh, the, the day that he died. And, and this feast day that was chosen was December 9th. And I always remembered something that he had said before um, in, in a number of retreats, but he said, I pray every single day of my life that I will die, I will drop dead before our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament on a feast day of Our Lady. So when I researched his life, I was, I was doing my doctorate as well. I was like, oh my gosh, he, you know, he died on the 9th. I felt like, well, he missed the mark. <laughs> um, and, you know, I'm trying to rationalize like, well, maybe he really did die on the 8th, all this kind of stuff. Anyway, the 9th was, then it triggered me. Because I was like, this is a man who got what he asked for. He, they found him in his private chapel on the 9th. And then my mind went to, that's the first day that Our Lady appeared in Mexico City, you know, the geographic center of all the Americas. Mm. And Our Lady Guadalupe represents the, the the spiritual conquest of the Americas, bringing Christianity. The, the first evangelization of the Americas is right there. And then... Sheen said over and over, he says, God doesn't do anything in history without the greatest finesse of detail. He was referring to why Fatima, 1917, why that place, location, time, all of that. So I, I applied that to his death, and I was like, why would God combine this special day of Our Lady's first appearance in the conquest of the Americas, the evangelization of the Americas, with the day that Sheen died and then this whole mystery of the Immaculate Conception that ties into Our Lady Guadalupe, um, because at that time, the Immaculate Conception was celebrated on December 9th. It wasn't in December 8th until really centuries later. So Juan Diego would have been basically going to Mass to celebrate the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. What do all of these things have to do with Fulton Sheen? Because now heaven has put Sheen into this picture. And so... What it does say is that Sheen has something to do with the evangelization of the Americas at this particular time. I would say the reconquest of the Americas. Um, Sheen, as you said, mentioned he was a very prophetic figure. He said, clearly, we are at the end of an era. And he said, the church over the last 2,000 years works in 500-year cycles. We're at the end of this fourth cycle of 500 years. And if you want to start zeroing in even more, the, the significance of um, 2031 is, uh, it, like you were saying, it's mind-blowing because if you look at what doctors of the church, um, saints, mystics, have pointed to, when you look at the, the, uh, the age of, they would say, of, of the world since creation, it brings it into around the 6,000 years. And if you look at the time since Christ's redemption, it brings it in at basically precisely 2,000 years. What does that mean? Well, we can talk about that in a minute, but uh, my, my mind went to these are not just mere coincidences as we are now seeing the entire world being prepared for an entirely new era. And like the Latin saying goes, motus fine in voce, things quicken at the end. So what Sheen said 80 years ago, we are living in the times of the apocalypse, the last days of our era. He saw this during World War II and he said, if mankind doesn't get its act together, 
two things will happen. One, it's going to end up in cyclical wars, which it did. And two, communism will come back to the West and basically be the instrument of liquidating what he called a bourgeois society. And here we are. Everything is coming down. And there's no way to stop it. And at the same time, it has to. So introduction to that. It's such a deep topic. Fulton Sheen on the end times. When I when I interviewed uh, on the book Fulton Sheen on the demoniac, and he, I love the way he would say it, the demoniac, the 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 demonic by Emmaus Road Publishing. I think it was last week. I was fascinated by Fulton Sheen talking about in that book how even he could see that there would be a uh, there would be a further corruption from within the holy mother church that with, from even from within the hierarchy and this is a very consistent message with lots of of uh, apparitions and messages that have happened over the over the many centuries um you know our lady of the purification in ecuador uh, our lady of revelation in rome fatima even there's i mean la salette there's so many that you could go to that i think are are really uh, akita i mean you know, we just think about these things and we think oh it's just it's piety it's it's uh, pie in the sky stuff, and it really can't be that bad because we have to just trust the system and everything is fine. And yet the water is starting to boil here a little bit, and we're looking around like frogs going, well, hey, how do we get out of this this mess? And Fulton Sheen seemed to see this coming from his time. Do you, you, you think he was – do you think he was really warning us, or do you th- was he a prophet, or could, is he just like Sherlock Holmes and he could read, he could read uh, the, uh, the, the evidence better than most? I think it's all of the above. Uh, I mean, his, his whole passion, he, he says it right in, in his autobiography. He wanted his mission was to know what the modern world was thinking on every level, not just in not just in philosophy, although that was probably one of the most important what it was saying in the natural sciences, in politics, in all of these different things. And then to be able to, to respond to its errors. And he said, using St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, because everything that the world was lacking, he realized St. Thomas gave to us through metaphysics and and so many other levels. And so, you know, that's why he went to Louvain and studied there in the Institute for Philosophy. It was all about what's the modern world thinking. And like Sheen said, the church is never behind the times. The church is beyond time. And Sheen, using his intellect, was able to, to see where things were going because he actually knew the enemy. Like our Lord says, you have to know your enemy. So she knew communism better than the communists did. Mm. You know, when I make a reference to something at times, you know, a lot of times like I haven't maybe read the entire <laughs> work on something. Um, she, he read it cover to cover, knew it, studied it. And so he just had that caliber. And I think that's why he was such a gift. He was a gift to the church intellectually. He was a gift to the church prophetically because he saw where these things were going and it made him unpopular. People don't realize that. Yes, he was popular on TV, but behind the scenes, he was uh, unpopular with uh, Roosevelt when he mm-hmm. told them don't trust the Russians at that time. Um, and so I think that, uh, you know, Sheen, he had the ability, kind of like what we're doing, to, doing today, there are certain things that um, you have some prophetic insight into because of what God is doing in the world. But then there's also just applying our intellects critically and you can see the writing on the wall and the things that you're talking about, um, things that used to be taboo, New World Order, uh, all of these kinds of things. It's all mainstream talk right now. It's just there it is. Now, what are you going to do about it? Sheen was calling these things later on and, and see, said even about America. He says, if America collapses, it's going to collapse from within. And that's exactly what we're experiencing. There's going to be like the, U, the, the America as we know it is over and it will not come back. And Sheen said that um, in a number of broadcasts, including even in World War II, it was famous one, the end of Christendom. And he said, and we don't want to go back to the way things were because it was precisely those things that brought about totalitarianism. Do you think do, Fulton Sheen was one of the foremost voices against communism in his time? And I just recently I went through Church of Spies and Operation Gladio books, and one of the things that I kind of took away from from both of those books was there was in some ways a bit of overreaction, like the pendulum swung too far after the Second World War towards fighting communism on a secular level, not on a spiritual one. I think Fulton Sheen was focused fighting spiritually. 
But I think the CIA mm -hmm. and the intelligence apparatus who was knee deep with uh, many at the Vatican at the time because their efforts to combat Hitler and the Nazis, I think that pendulum swung too far. The Vatican Bank got involved and the scandals have been rocking us ever since then. And it's just gotten worse. Do you think Fulton Sheen saw those differences? Do, 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 was Fulton Sheen's efforts to fight communism in the eras of Russia that spread across the world would would he have would he have supported the secular means as well as spiritual means, or was he focused uh, strictly on the spiritual? That's a great question. Um, I I think it was both. I mean, clearly he he fought it on a um, philosophical level and 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 a spiritual level. He also he saw that if it's not defeated, even on a secular level, then it's going to lead to a society that is animalistic and materialistic uh, and and um, authoritarian. And he talked about that even in that same broadcast, the end of Christendom. He says there's basically three things that um, are at play here, basically the Christian view of life, the animal view of life, and materialistic view of life, an authoritarian one. And, and he says communism has to be defeated on every level. But it's sort of like you think about it, you know, the conquest, I just would to kind of go back to Guadalupe for a minute. The Aztec Empire had to be conquered really before the spiritual one could kick in. Some might say, well, God can do anything. Well, he can. And he did perform the greatest miracle of conversions the world has ever seen. But he did go in and he did clear and pave the way through Cortez. And that military yes. campaign Ooh. then paved the way for the church. Amen. Well said. Let's pause there. Dr. Peter Howard is our guest from the Fulton Sheen Institute. We're going to put a link to it, but it's FultonSheen.Institute if you want to check it out. We'll put it in the show notes. Can I just give a special shout out to KSB Benedict Noble? You're amazing. God bless you. God love you. Coming up after the break, let's talk about my man, Hernan Cortez. Oh, if, as Holy Roman Emperor, I'd put him up for canonization. Coming up. Don't go anywhere. Be right back. be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Hey, I want to thank our sponsor who helps us to do what we do in addition to great people like KSW Benedict and Oblate. iCatholicMobile.com is on the team and we couldn't be happier. You know, there's there's other companies out there, Charity and Patria Mobile. That's true, but this is the only Catholic one in the world that I'm aware of. Yes, there's unlimited talks, a talk and text, and there's unlimited data plans too. That's true. Praise be to God. But you know, if you got to pay a phone bill, a cell phone bill, why not have that phone bill support Catholic media organizations like ours, especially in an era where they're trying to control that narrative and lock down our voice? You could be a big part of keeping us going every single day. iCatholicMobile.com is our sponsor's website. You should check them out. iCatholicMobile.com. We'll put a link to it in the show notes. But we're having a conversation about Fulton Sheen, the venerable Fulton Sheen. I want to talk about uh, and maybe in the after show coming up, maybe uh, about why he hasn't moved forward in his canonization. That's a scandal that continues to rock the church, in my opinion. But Dr. Peter Howard of the Fulton Sheen Institute is here. Fulton Sheen dot Institute is his website. Welcome back to the program. Thank you for for being on with us this morning. Do appreciate having you here. I want to talk about her now. You brought up who you triggered me. You must my my producer must have <laughs> told you where my secret button is. Anytime someone mentions Hernan Cortez, I'm totally triggered by it because I absolutely love, love, love her, what Hernan Cortez did to defeat the devil himself, the hummingbird wizard, in his keep there in Mexico City back in the uh, early 16th century. And I got to tell you, most people don't know the actual facts. They've never read original sources. Ooh. I have the original source sitting right next to me right over here, it, and I, I, I quote it all the time. It's amazing. And in today, most people also don't know, and I have another book sitting right over here, that the Hummingbird Wizard is being uh, worshipped yet again in Mexico today. Mm. Randall Sullivan was there. He was in the cave. He saw the altar. He saw the sacrifices, and he was told that if he didn't leave, he would be one of the sacrifices. Because human mm. sacrifice is definitely uh, also being uh, conducted yet again in Mexico uh, right now to the Hummingbird Wizard. So I feel like the timing of things is coming to a point. It's coming to a head. And Our Lady, who once crushed the head of the serpent, is coming back to crush it again. Do you think that? 
Absolutely. You nailed it right on there. And I think that it is important to understand this history because um, it hit me really hard. Uh, I think it was last, yeah, last year, because I think it was uh, August or so of 2023, Mexico legalized abortion. And um, and it brought it to a whole new level. And my first thought was, now everything has come full circle. Everything's basically be un- has is ha- um, has been undone since Our Lady conquered Mexico and you know the Americas. You look at um, I don't know how what the total would be, but probably uh, over a hundred million. I mean, the United States is probably what sixty five million plus um, babies that are aborted. So the culture of death is back, and it's no coincidence that it's coming to a head. And and my personal belief is that this is all over by 2031. Wow. The reconquest. I also— Everything points to it. You know, I'm getting ready to launch this uh, Bible study on salvation history, and uh, I'm going to be stealing heavily from Dr. Hahn. Father Keeps His Promises is by far my favorite book he Mm -hmm. ever wrote. Because it's the watered-down version of his doctoral thesis, which means yeah. I can even understand it. Praise be to God. I have his doctoral thesis too. It's just, it's just too heady for me. But this is fantastic, and I love the epics, the periods, right? So, and I think most Catholics don't understand the epics and the periods of salvation history, and that's why we're doing the Bible study. But we talk about the two thousand year periods, right? So there's these two thousand year sections of time, and they also align. With 2031, do they not? They do. There's just, there's, yeah, there's periods of purification through the world. I think one of the challenges is the Catholics, myself included, you know, we were all raised to think in just a very secular, scientific way without any exposure to how the fathers thought, how the um, doctors like St. Alphonsus Liguori, saints like St. Saint Louis Marie de Montfort, and then, you know, others like Blessed and, and, and Catherine Emmerich, how they understood the history of of creation and then the history of redemption. And it, it, it smacks right in the face of all the stuff that we're taught about billions of years to this and this and that. And I think Sheen would, would jump into that as well to a certain degree, because he said that that kind of thinking really makes, he called it cosmic intimidation. It leads to mankind feeling insignificant. So I think that that's, you know, um, it's important that we rediscover uh, these these truths because then everything does really align, and like I said, now we're we're coming up to the the six thousandth day um, or anniversary of um, the creation of the world, and then of course um, six uh, the two thousandth anniversary of redemption. Something's happening, and like I said, you don't even need prophecy. You don't even need prophecy to see these things happening. Um, you cover these things well every day, and you're talking. You know, we're we're a hairline, you know, away from nuclear war. If people are following what's going on in the UK, the United States, the missiles we're sending. I mean, this doesn't require prophecy. Prophecy. It's like it's just it's the fulfillment of things that have been said. Like you mentioned, in in, in valid, authentic prophecies that we've already had. You know, if and I, again, I love the I love the typology in it. I love the metaphor of it. You know, if if we're coming in to the end of the sixth day, that means we're coming into the seventh day, which is the day of rest, which means through the chaos, through the turmoil, through the tribulation, we'll have an era of peace that matches prophecy. Exactly. That's exactly it. I mean, are people are wondering when is this era of peace and the triumph of the immaculate heart? Well. We know it has to, I mean, it really has to come soon or we will destroy ourselves. Um, and I think most Catholics are living in the state of denial. You mentioned it with your analogy of the boiling water. Um, I think, yeah, it's already boiling and it's, uh, we're, we're just kind of now in the, this period of the final sifting. And there are some magnificent prophecies that we'll see um, that, we'll, I guess you could say, are on deck, you know, things that are attached to um Apparition sites like Garibandal, not an, there's not an official approval or denial of it, but other saints. I mean, there's a lot of um, prophecies that surround these kinds of things of a global illumination of conscience. It's almost like a movie. You know, we're about to really enter into this divine section of things as mankind is allowed to exhaust itself and its own evils. God is about to step in. I mean, he has to, or it, there is no future and we still have, you know, if, if this timeline is true, 
we have what uh, six and a half years or something like that. Right. So yeah. a lot, a lot is in that mix, and some Catholics roll their eyes, but it's right before them. I mean, you literally have to be in a, in a strong state of denial to not see these things, um, and and the, the cost of ignoring them is the loss of your own soul, is the loss of your marriage, it is the loss of your family, because things are only going to get tougher before they get better. I, you know, and I, I want to reiterate that there's not a, it's not an opportunity to despair. We live in very interesting times. They're not boring times mm-hmm. that we live in. Praise be to God. It could be boring. It's not. Um, then our, then our sins would be even worse, in my opinion. But because they're interesting, they're clear, they're stark. It's a wake up call to live in a state of grace, to pursue virtue, to be obedient to our state in life. Do those things, and we don't have to worry, do we? No, and and I think that's that's the point we got to bring people back to. Um, our Lady has made this very clear in all, all of her major apparitions of the last 200 years. But let's just say just Fatima. And if you want to connect Fatima with Fulton Sheen, what really made him a saint is that he lived the message of Fatima to a heroic level. What did she ask us to do? First, the angel. In a godless world, what do we need to do? Adoration. She made a daily holy hour for 60 years. He said that's the number one thing that's going to bring peace. Secondly, pray the rosary every day for peace and an end to war. Third, make reparation and make sacrifices for sinners. And four, you have consecration to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. If you're living these things, you're putting your family in the refuge of Mary's Immaculate Heart. She said in June 13th, we have nothing to fear. And like you said, we are living in biblical times. When people say, well, I really wish, you know, these fantastic times of the past. These are apocalyptic times in the the literal sense of that. They are. They are indeed. Hey, Dr. Okay. Peter Howard, I appreciate you being on the radio side of our show today. We're going to put a link to uh, your website, FultonSheen.Institute, in the show notes. You can go to uh, the stationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. By the way, if you want to get in on the Bible study, you got to be on the email list. I'll send an email out this Friday, tomorrow, with all the instructions. It's going to be a Zoom a Bible study every Wednesday night starting October the 9th. So if you want to get access to that, be on the email list. Go to the stationofthecross.com forward slash A-C-T. God love you and God bless you. Catholic Radio has just been a lifesaver for me. I still listen to it every day. I start my day with it. I listen to it all day long as much as I can. I am very grateful for it. It's just an amazing thing to have as I am new to Catholicism. Obviously, it's not only helping me, but it's helping so many other people on their walk. Thank you. God bless you for iCatholic Radio. It has changed my life. Donate today at thestationofthecross.com. And we're back. Welcome to the after show, everyone. Hey, good morning, everybody. Praise be to God. Um, 2031. It's going to be here before you know it. Oh, I want to. There's so many things I, w- I really kind of want to jump into. Uh, but let me just give some shout outs. Damon, good morning to you, Paul, our friend from Buffalo. Good morning to you, Paul. Adoration time. I, the guy gets up early to go to adoration. Praise be to Jesus. One in the morning. Look at that. That's so amazing. Eileen, good morning to you. Some of my favorite adoration time has always been in the middle of the night. I'm telling you. We, at the end of the wild uh, men's retreats that I used to participate in with my buddy Mark Houck. We'd, uh, we'd have an adoration chapel and we'd make the men like sort of cover all the hours. I would always take like the two, three o'clock hour if I could, you know, because there's just something to, and we would do those in cabins because it's always rugged cabins by candlelight. Oh, it's the best three o'clock in the morning, the monstrance, you and a candle. Just think about that. So good. Eileen, good morning to you. Yvonne, good morning to you. Kevin, Yvette. Good morning to you. Praise be to God. Glad you're on the team today. Uh, Mateus is here from sunny California. Up early today, I see. Mike K., our friend from Virginia. T-Storm, good morning to you. Praise be to Jesus. Jen Nugent, welcome to the team. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Has, uh, he put a link to uh, Stacy Plaskett confirms the DOJ and FBI have been weaponized. I think we all know that by now. I think it's pretty, pretty darn obvious just how... Uh, just how weaponized things really are. Hey, Junior Barra, my friend from West Texas, good morning to you. Mimi, good morning to you. Patty, Jane, Donald Paddock, Lori, good morning over on the Facebooks. I see Len Pine, Sci-Fi, Apoc Gabriel's here. Our usual suspects on Rumble, K, K, J, Jaber. How do I say your name correctly? K, Jiber, J, 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 I, G, J, I. I, there's a fun, I saw a funny video yesterday of how messed up English is. English language, like how, 
like certain sounds are are inconsistent when used in different words. You know, it it just reminded me just how messed up our English language is. As Holy Roman Emperor, if you should vote for me, I promise to standardize language and get rid of all silent letters. Why do we have a letter that we don't pronounce? This is of the devil. We're getting rid of it. Uh, So that's part of my policy platform. Make sure to vote often, vote twice, get your friends, get your dead relatives to vote for me. That'd be amazing. Honey West uh, 25, good morning. Cherokee Woman 20, thanks for being on the team today. Honey West says, can you... Can your guest please expand on the six-year timeline? Thanks. I think you mean the 6,000 years, which is also six days. So this the days of creation, six days of, of creation on the seventh day he rested. So that, that same framework, which is what we're going to go through on the Bible study as well, that same framework is extended out into epochs of time, epochs of time. 2,000 year increments. And when you go back and look at the covenant mediators of salvation history, you see that they're broken up in these neat little 2,000 year packages. And, uh, and God, as, as Scott Hahn would say, God writes history like man writes a novel. And I, and I think we're seeing that. So in, we're seeing the, uh, the 6,000 year period come to an end, which means we're entering into the, the day of rest. Uh, do you want to further elaborate on that, Dr. Howard? Actually, Joe, I think you did a great job uh, summarizing that, and I, I think, yeah, it, it goes to how the how the church has understood its its history, not in just some kind of figurative sense, but more literally uh, than people realize. And um, I always recommend um, if people want to really dive into this question of the dating and creation and how the fathers and doctors of the church. There's an entire center dedicated to this. It's called the Colby Center. I believe mm-hmm. they're out of Virginia. Their work is amazing. Um, Hugh you know, Owen, I had a, yeah. I just, yeah, Hugh Owen. Um, I had my mind blown when I was just a spectator listening in on a symposium that they had in Illinois. Grabbed every work I could. So you have, you know, this is one here. It's just called I Have Spoken to You from Heaven, a Catholic defense of creation in six days. It's important. Because, like you said, this is how we also begin to see how things do come together. We are entering now, or approaching really very soon, the seventh day, which is a which is a day of rest, and it co- corresponds also with um, with what Our Lady says of an era of peace. I mean, we do, we know that that's very very soon. So, um, and I believe also the uh, I have to double check, but I think you know when you're looking at the, the times of purification of the world, I think Noah was two thousand years in. You can correct me, Joe, if I'm wrong on that. And then you have redemption 2,000 years later, and then 6,000. Um, then we're at another time of purification of the world. That word purification has been used a number of times in, by our Blessed Mother. And, uh, and and the reason why this prophetic sense is, is important, because, one, the world is so secular, it's lost the sense of God. That was a big point of Fulton Sheen. Um, and two, um, Our Lord says, you know, in scripture that God doesn't do anything without first revealing it to his prophets. So the prophetic part is, is important. And today it can get muddled because, you know, the devil wants to discredit it as well. So how do you hide a tree? You know, you put it in a forest and then you can't find it. I think the devil's doing that today. So in the end, we just need to focus. And I think your Bible study and combined with some of the things like that I'm talking about here is going to help put Catholics on a, on a, the right trajectory. And in the end, it's extremely hopeful, even though we're going to have to go through these new times of Noah, and you're going to be mocked for the things that you do, especially by your fellow Catholics. You'll find probably yeah. greater allies by with non-Catholics who at least have a sense of things. But in the end, we have been blessed to have the fullness of um, the revelation for these times and just the fullness of the faith and it's our job to start right now also thinking, how are we going to start remaking the world, which was a huge point of Fulton Sheen in the midst of, as he was talking about how everything was coming down, he says, we have to remake the world and we have to lead it. So that's a, you know, a topic for Amen. another time. Yeah. Alan Smith is on the team. Al was at the, the big conference in <laughs> Niagara Falls back in, uh, back in August, and it was great to meet him in person. Al is an amazing man and a, and a strong and incredible, vibrant supporter and promoter of Archbishop Fulton Sheen. And it just, I just love his uh, tenacity to make sure people know and love Fulton Sheen. And he says, uh, 
He says, Archbishop Fulton Sheen gave a great quote when he wrote, uh, unless souls are saved, nothing is saved. Yay and amen, Al. It was so good to see you. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Praise be to God. Hey, Helen Grace, good morning to you. Christine, welcome back. Evelyn, Miriam, good morning to you. Improximus points out today, is it today or tomorrow? When does the, oh, it begins tomorrow, the pilgrimage to Orisville begins tomorrow. I'm so jealous. I would love to do that pilgrimage. There's one coming up. There's a similar pilgrimage going to happen at Clear Creek Abbey in Oklahoma in October. Um, I might try to take the family or at least some of the kids to go do that one. I think it's going to be like 30 miles or something like that. I'm hoping to do that. I've always wanted to do a big pilgrimage uh, along those lines. Maybe someday we'll do the one in France. Who knows? I don't know. Maybe someday. But uh, that's pr- we'll be praying in Proximus. Thank you for, for reminding us about that. Uh, KSW Benedict and Oblate again. You are excellent. God bless you. Thanks for your generosity. Little Daisy, Little Daisy says, great show today. I'm thankful we are still in a time we can listen to shows such as this. May our blessed mother protect you and your family under her mantle. Yay and amen. Well, Daisy, I, I got to tell you, I think the time is is coming f- faster than we think it is. I mean, I, whenever I ask this, and I'm going to get your take on this, Dr. Howard, most people, you seem to be close to me in age. I don't know how old you are, but you don't seem, you don't seem too far off of, of my age. I'm 50. Um, but even when I even ask older people. Same age. Yeah. Oh, I'm 50. Oh, golly, Jewish. Man, so bad. I know. Anyway, um, I need the wisdom now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is, whenever I ask people of 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 uh, greater vintage than us, and I say, you know, you've experienced more than I have. You remember more than I have. You've gone through more interesting times than I have. Do you think is, has there ever been a time like this? They all they all say no. They say they can't recall things being this crazy in any other point in their life. That's 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 that says a lot when you've gone through. The 20th century, which was the bloodiest century in a millennia or more, that's saying a lot when you've had to, uh, you know, do do nuclear war drills in your classroom on a routine basis. That says a lot, given all that we've encountered, that these times that we live in are the more, more interesting times. And and I pointed this out earlier in the show, and I think it's worth reiterating that on Sunday – the United Nations passed their Pact for the Future resolutions on bullet point 82. I don't think they go by – they don't go by paragraph. It's bullet point 82. It's the section on – and I'll give you the – it says action 54. We will strengthen the international response to complex global, global shocks. Number one, the gobbledygook language. I wonder if they use the same uh, ghost writers as the Vatican does for some of their documents. It's gobbledygook. I mean, it's not clear. It's not precise. It's not Fulton Sheen. It ain't Benedict the Sixteenth. It's gobbledygook language. That's number one. Global shocks. The first sentence of which says, we recognize the need for a more coherent, cooperative, coordinated, and multidimensional international response to complex global shocks and the central role of the United Nations in this regard, like it's, it's, it's mind blowing how much nonsense they, they like they, they pull out the thesaurus and they start going, we should throw in a word or two more. This this sentence doesn't have enough of uh, of craziness in it. So they what does this mean? Can you think of a global shock? I don't know. Pandemic. Anyone? 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 World War Three. So what they wanted and here's the kicker, what they wanted and they had to dumb this down in order to get it passed. What they wanted was a resolution that all governments of the world would agree to that says if there's a global shock, the UN Secretary General becomes the supreme overlord. My, my word's not theirs. I'm just embellishing. The supreme overlord of the world so essentially gets to enact a one world government to, be able to better manage a global shock. Now, that didn't go over all that well to some of the countries, so they dumbed it down basically to say, hey, UN Secretary, can you come back to us later with some ideas about what to do in global shocks? So they they tabled it. They punted the ball down the road. But I bring all of this out to say they are pushing hard for one world government, and they're this far away from it. That's real. That's not that's not just pie in the sky stuff. That's not just left behind and and the evangelical stuff. That's 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 real. 
They're that close to getting what they want. And if you go read this document, it should give you pause. Uh, it, do, you, do you have any th- thoughts on that, Dr. Howard? Yeah, well, I, it's very important um, that Catholics wake up to this. Uh, you know, we've been talking about, at least uh, I, I've been emphasizing you know, the, the 2031 as a, as a victory marker, I guess you could say, uh, ushering in a new era. And the enemy has made it very, very clear what their agenda is. And when they want it done by, they want theirs done by 2030. Look at you, not UN Agenda 2030. That's it's in the document. all of this. They've been trying this now for a long time. The United Nations in tandem with the World Health Organization. And as long as they can get countries to sign over to them determining whatever a crisis is, a quote unquote pandemic or world economic forum, they want to, you know, we've been promised a massive cyber attack. This isn't you know, maybe like they're saying it's going to happen. Be prepared for it. There's something about evil where they basically tell you it's like a psycho, like a psychopathic killer who's going to tell its victim what it's going to do to him, to this person before it happens. And they've been doing this. There aren't really any surprises if you know what the enemy's up to. And as crises keep unfolding and people get confused and countries get weaker and more desperate, they're just primed to have an occasion where everyone's going to turn to something and they'll have just enough, you know, uh, of a grip on things where they can pass it. And then you're under, yeah, the whole world comes under United Nations control. And it's beyond that. There's the United Nations troops all over different countries. They've even had presence in our own. It's not, it's not like it's so far down the road that we don't have to worry about it. It's we're on the precipice of that. They are pushing. If you read this document and I've only read half of it, because it's so huge, there is – it's replete with Agenda 2030. I mean they, they name it. They're pushing. They're advancing those goals. Um, climate change, gender equality is in there a lot. DEI is in there a lot. They are wanting to enact a world financial system. That's – at that they're stating it. They're telling you what they want to do. It's written right there. They're not hiding it. It's not in the shadows. It's all right there. You just got to interpret their thesaurus language in there. Otherwise, it's so clear. And then, of course, one world government all on the stage. And it could happen so fast, so fast. Um, and then you couple that with with the powers that be at the local level, like in our case here in the United States, in Kamala Harris, who, if she gets elected, has said – she intends to weaponize the DOJ in a way that uh, would be even more aggressive. And she was far to the left. She was the most leftist of all the uh, of all the Congress men and women prior to her becoming vice president. She was left of Bernie Sanders. Let that sink in. And that's what we're dealing with. So it could happen very fast. So 2031 is not very far off. And things could escalate very, very quickly. Although I am of the opinion – And I'd like to get your take on this. I did an entire documentary on the end times and I presented in that documentary film. I released it in December, uh, a few views, a couple of views of Catholic thought on end times timelines. One was the uh, end of the present age. One was uh, Bartholomew Holhauser. And there was a couple of others Mm -hmm. and they have differing opinions on the order of events. Um, Bartholomew Holhauser believes we're going to come to something more akin to what we've been talking about, where you will you'll have a sort of like a, a World War Three type of thing. There's like massive loss of human life, tribulation, great chastisement, persecution, but then an era of peace. Then that era of peace will come and go. Men will go back to their old sinful ways. Then comes the Antichrist. Then comes the end. Whereas if you read uh, if you read the end of the present age, there seems to be like he can't uh, the priest who wrote that back in the 19th century, he can't seem to wrap his head around how you could go through a tribulation, have an era of peace and have another tribulation. He seemed to struggle with that. So his timing on those final bits and pieces was uh, was seeming seemingly different than others. What what do you say about the the order of events in the end? <laughs> Excuse me. I, I tend to actually lean more toward Father Armijan, who's you're, you're mentioning. Um, I think uh, if you're looking at the prophetic consensus of things over the last, not just the last two centuries, but even going back further, um, I, I think I think we see the Antichrist in this period before the 
uh, before the era of peace. Um, and then uh, even Fulton Sheen definitely hints toward this as well, um, because he basically says, you know, and Christ himself even hints at the fact, he's like, well, when Christ comes again, we'll come at a time of a cosmic battle against the Antichrist. He says, not really, because Christ says, when I come back, will I find any faith on the earth? In other words, over time, there will be a time of a plenty will lead toward a time of just gradual apathy, you can say. And then like a thief in the night, he'll come. When you're in the midst of a battle, there's lots of faith. Everybody's looking for, everybody's looking for the coming at that point. I think a lot of the things, especially in this time of, uh, of in which we're living, I think the Antichrist is alive. I think he will um, surface within the next couple of years. Um, just because everything that the Antichrist would need is already here. It's he has more than he po- could possibly want. This, the the you can say the the kind of the apostles of the Antichrist are already out there. That's why I don't see this as being something that's in a, a, a long period ahead. Mm-hmm. I think that this purification of the world is going to involve his coming, his reign, three and a half years, and then a def- uh, decisive defeat of him, and then other prophecies. I mean, these you know these are prophetic things, so it's. Um, whether it be, you know, you, you hear of uh, things like the three days of darkness and all that. I think looking at what various saints and mystics have said, I think that, that would come at the very, very end. Uh, whatever's not, not cleansed at that point will be, will be purified at that point. Um, and, you know, how, how it's all going to play, I'm not exactly sure. But I do think that I like the an analogy of a storm, you know, of a hurricane, you know, we have a hurricane now hitting Florida, Mexico, how you have a uh, hurricane, then you have the eye, and then around the eye, you have those turbulent times. And then you have a time of a kind of a calm, and then it picks up again, and the uh, other side of the eye, really, really stormy, and then it kind of plays out. I think that's kind of what I think we're going to see. I think things that are prophesied, even by saints like um, uh, St. Maria Faustina, this um, global illumination of conscience, the warning, um, I do think that there's a uh, strong credibility to them and I can see how they would play out within this time frame that we're in right now. And, and by the time, um, uh, you know, the, the, the 2030, 2031 comes around, this is, uh, almost like a Narnia moment <laughs> where like the era of peace will be something that we have never, we couldn't, we couldn't quite fathom. It won't just be in the absence of war. It will be a time in the world that we've never seen. It'll be the greatest glory of the, of the church's history that it's ever seen. Um, and then, you know, I don't know how long that period is going to be, but I, I see it all playing out very much like Father Armijan does or um, in, in his timeline. So hey, Angel Knight, good morning. Work. Angel Knight, good morning to you. Linda, good morning to you. Uh Chicho, mi amigo, que tal, brother? Uh wants to know what's the format of the Bible study? Should we begin reading the book before? Homework. Is there homework? You know, it's interesting you br- you bring that up, Pola Chicho, because uh I tend to gloss over the first section fairly quickly, uh, which is the housekeeping part of the book. So if you really want to read start, I would say read that first section, which basically breaks it down. Dr. Hahn is basically saying, hey, this is how Catholics see Scripture. This is how Catholics uh, interpret Scripture. So it's like that. It's the it's the housekeeping stuff. I like to jump into the fun stuff, which is starting out with Genesis chapter 1. So my thought was I was going to start with a brief overview of that housekeeping and then jump right into the, uh, the uh, six days of creation and then going into the seventh day. And so the, like the first lesson ends with at the end of uh, Genesis chapter one. Second lesson begins with Genesis chapter two. That's the good stuff. That's the fun stuff. So I want to get to that as fast as I can. But it is important to understand things like, you know, allegory and 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 all of those things. And he, he gets into that, he does it very, very well. So I would say if you want to read that part first, that's a good place to start. And that way we don't have to spend so much time on the housekeeping. We can sort of jump into the to the weeds. Uh, Jimmy Z, good morning to you again. Anthony, good morning to you. Praise be to God. Frank Rangel, Deborah, good morning to you. Judith Fortuna, good morning to you. Thanks for being on the team today. Little Daisy again, welcome back. Glad to see you here. Um, let's see, Honey West says, oh, actually, I, want to point, I wanted to point out that uh, 
APOC Gabriel loves Alan Smith. Um, that's awesome. It says awesome guy. Uh, yeah, he, man. I, APOC Gabriel also points out that uh, the UN Secretary is from UN Secretary General is from Portugal. Is that right? Uh, that's interesting. I think that's a nice little connection to two Fatima. Mm. Um, Honey West points out Russia and China voted no on the takeover, but Biden voted yes. Of course they did, right? Like, golly, you is like it can't even help themselves. They're all like hook, line, and sinker over the whole thing. War against our Lord and our Blessed Mother. Yeah, uh, Apoc Gabriel, indeed, indeed. Honeywest says, Protestants firmly believe in the rapture, but I've never heard the Catholic Church subscribe to it. No, we do not believe in the rapture. The closest thing I would think we could get to is at the final judgment, at the mm-hmm. final judgment, when, when, when time is over, there's not going to be any more time, you know, and the, the Lord has come to judge the world in the end, final consummation then maybe we're caught up to meet him in the sky. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Scott Hahn once, uh, I used to, if you didn't know, I used to be a huge Scott Hahn junkie back in the day. Um, and because I worked with the St. Paul Center uh, with an apostle that I used to be a part of back in the day. So I spent a lot of time. Anyway, um, I heard him once talk about this. When, when a king would visit a village in the first century Palestine in, in Israel, when the king would come to visit the town, the town would go out of the gates to meet him, to greet him and to bring him in. It's exactly what we saw when our Lord comes on the donkey and they meet him with the palm branches, Palm Sunday. It's that same effect. They're going to meet the king and they're escorting him in. So when the Lord comes, will the faithful meet the king and escort him in? But there is no time when when uh, the faithful, the believers, the saved are taken away. And this, and this is part of the danger. I'm a traditional Catholic, and I see that in some circles of traditional Catholicism there, that this danger exists. And that is I can be saved from, from the pain and the suffering. I can separate myself from the, from the, from the heresy, from the, from the abuse, from the craziness that happens even within certain prelates and, and hierarchy of the church. No, you can't. Christ expects you to join him on the cross, look down from the cross, and see your beloved family members there spitting at you and mocking you and cursing you. Just like the prophet Hosea had to marry a harlot, a prostitute, so he would know what it's like to be a little bit like God. So we have to be a little bit like God and be abused by those that we should trust and love most. You are at no time allowed to escape the pain, the suffering, and the chastisement. You are expected to endure it until the end, because only those who endure to the end will be saved. That is gospel. And so uh, I believe, and I, Dr. Howard, you're welcome to chime in here. I believe, of course, we do not believe in a rapture. We will never be taken away from the suffering that is to come. We are expected to embrace it, pick up our cross, and follow our Lord to Calvary, and there die next to him like saints. And, uh, and so this idea that we're going to somehow be taken away and watch other people suffer, and we're going to be whew, saved from it, I think is I think is fantasy. What say you, Doctor Howard? Yeah, I agree with that, Joe. And I think uh, something else to consider, though, is um, God doesn't spare us from suffering, and and at the same time, you know, He has taken care of His saints at times. He doesn't He doesn't remove them from the um, like a rapture, of course. But once again, I'd like to to direct people to Our Lady of Fatima. She was very clear: "My immaculate heart will be your refuge." This isn't just a figure of speech. This is extremely real. When you live the message of Fatima, as she said, you know, um, entrusting yourself, consecrating yourself to her immaculate heart, living that every day, putting your family in there. Look at the the example, two examples. One was more dramatic than the other for the eight German Jesuits who survived Hiroshima at ground, you know, at ground zero, eight city blocks from where the bomb went off. As you've seen from the pictures, everything's incinerated, a complete devastation. Yet these eight Jesuits walked away from it with bruises and scratches and things, and they had no radiation damage, and there was nothing. It was a complete miracle. And eventually, Father Hubert Schiffer, who when they asked him, he was kind of the spokesman of the group, and how did you survive this? Since we have no scientific explanation, look, we live the message of Fatima every single day in our home. In our home, we pray the rosary every day. So what does that mean? Our Lady takes care of her own. When she says something, she means it. 
And one of the titles of Mary, she's the Ark of Salvation. Okay, Noah wasn't raptured into heaven and then kind of came back down. God provided for him an ark, and he had to be obedient. He had to enter it. He had to do it exactly as it was. Now Mary is the new ark of, of salvation for the souls today, and she's making that really clear in the places that she appeared, especially at Fatima with that kind of language. And so um, I think that that is also our hope, because when at the threat of nuclear war and other things, it's like, you know, Our Lady of Akita said the good will die with the just or with the bad. And um, but at the same time, we, there's a lot of precedents that Our Lady has also said, look, trust, trust me. And we really need I mean, we're, this is the time that we are called to not just faith, but heroic faith, because in a time of war, you're good. That's the only lens that allows you to to have peace of soul as you move forward fighting it. Yeah. Amen. Blaine D. Is it Diasi? Blaine Diasi? Uh, Blaine Diachi. I know who that is. Achi. It's a, it's a chi. Butter? It's Italian. It's di- Blaine yeah, Diachi. Diachi. I got to get that right. Uh, says uh, Peter how Howard. How are you, brother? So Blaine's in the in the chat. Thanks for hanging out with us today. <laughs> Anthony Abbott says, I'm still a Scott Hahn junkie. That's cool. Praise God. I like it. Um, Helen Grace, good morning to you. Thanks for being on. Kilroy Jones is here. Good morning, Kilroy Jones. Uh, said, writing on, writing on the city of New Orleans, Illinois Central, Monday morning rails. Are, we, are, there, are these tunes that we're talking about? Rick G says, the king of glory comes. The nation rejoices. Open the gates before him and lift up your voices. Yea and amen. Could you imagine like those that will actually be here for that moment? Like that blows the mind, which reminds me, there was a quote from St. Augustine, and I don't remember the exact reference, but St. Augustine actually, because anytime you talk about the end times and the Antichrist or the coming judgment or whatever, there's always going to be somebody, and I'm surprised it hasn't happened yet. There's always someone who says, you can't know the day or the hour. True. You can't. It's true. But you you do have to know the signs. That's what Jesus said. You got to know the signs. You can't know the day or the hour, but you need, need to know the signs and you got to read the signs and you got to act appropriately when you see the signs. So St. August, well, yeah, August- coming. That's the second coming though. You know, so it's, we don't know that, that when that is, but the, we, we can certainly see Prepare. the signs and seasons and yeah. even in the heavens and Gen- book of Genesis says, I give you the stars exactly. and all these things for signs and seasons. So all these eclipses and all these kinds of things in a real good just society, they are always saw something that was going on there because everything was made for us, not just randomness out there. Everything spoke has a biblical meaning as well. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So St. Augustine said he kind of was critiquing. I love St. Augustine because he like, he chides, he chides his own people. Sometimes he said, uh, you know, all of this, Oh, stop it. Everybody, St. Paul talked about we were in the end and every, all this talk about the end times, which never happens. It never actually comes. You know, and St. Paul's like, listen, trust me when I tell you, we don't know the day or the hour, but it's coming. Okay. You can't dismiss it simply because it hasn't happened yet. It's coming. Prepare yourself. And I, I you know, I'm paraphrasing because I'm trying to remember off the top of my head exactly what it said, but that was like the sense of it. And I absolutely love that because too often so you're going to get people and say, oh, stop. You know, there was worse times in the church and there was this and there was that. And it's like it's a it's a get out of jail free card to then dismiss everything. And I think that's the key there is you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yes, there were terrible times in the history of the church. There were bad popes. There were bad bishops. There were bad heresies and and all the rest. But if you're trying to use that as the let's just ignore everything happening now, then it's a mistake. And the opposite can be true as well. We have to find that balance. I think St. Augustine reminds us of that. By the way, um, uh, Paul, I think it's – is it Paul? Yeah, it's Paul, our friend, says, amen. We have to pick up our cross and carry it daily. Yay and amen, Paul. I want – okay, I do want to ask before um, we run out of time today. Can can we talk about Fulton Sheen's canonization? Um, Sure. Why do you – I mean – I guess, A, do you think he will be canonized or is that ship sailed? And B, why is he not, why isn't he being canonized? Well, uh, first question, I do think he'll, whether or not we see his full canonization, I don't know. 
Um, his beatification, I think we will see. Um, this is a big, big topic, obviously, for me. Uh, lots of issues going on there. Um, the first thing I'd like to point out for people is that Rome has already determined that he's blessed. Like he already is. The approval of the miracle, the decree that came out July 5th, 2019, says he's cleared for a now-to-be-proclaimed blessed. Rome's already determined that he's blessed. All they have to do, it's a ceremonial mass. Like there's nothing that change. There's no change that takes place at this mass other than they have a, you know, a little formula and it just allows everybody then to, to call him blessed, but they've already determined that he is. So um, that's one question that people don't really realize. Um, and I'm, I'm almost tempted just to call him that because, well, what would they say? You can't say that. Well, is he not blessed? We haven't said that he is. Does that like magically add something to him? Can it ever be changed? Are you saying that there's a possibility in any way, shape, or form that Rome's wrong? And if you do that, you know the theological ramifications of that. Um, and it, so there's a lot of issues with something that seems so sort of benign. Um, the the next question of when that's really up to the diocese of Peoria at this point. You know, in the beginning last year, we started a movement that was to really draw attention to this. And it was always, well, the Diocese of Rochester and, uh, you know, inquiry to Rome. They said, we can pause it, all this other stuff. The Diocese of Peoria, the um, Archbishop Fulton Sheen Foundation, uh, led now the President, Monsignor Jason Gray, they've all admitted that there's absolutely nothing that's holding this back. And I always say, everybody go watch the interview with Raymond Arroyo last summer in August. Raymond did a great job interviewing him. And you can see at times he was kind of perplexed, like, well, so like, what's the issue? The real question is, is why won't the Diocese of Peoria proclaim him blessed? Why won't they? And I'm not saying, oh, they're going to have an excuse because of this attorney general report, which they know is irrelevant. They know it. They've admitted in that interview, it will not change anything. And then at the very end of the interview, my senior grade then said, well, we want the unanimous support of all the bishops before we do this. That was never even said before. Like more than anything, when you hear something like that, that makes you think it will never happen because you'll never get the unanimous support of the bishops on anything. But I think that, I think it will come. I mean, you look at the Diocese of Peoria, they just shut down half their parishes. I mean, Sheen's right. got to be rolling in his grave right, right. now it, where his body is in the cathedral. And they say in one sentence, we need Sheen now more than ever, quote, unquote. Those are their words. The next sentence, this is where you know there's something going on behind the scenes. It's a company line. But out of an abundance of caution, we blah, 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 blah. blah. We're going to wait. <laughs> yeah. Out of an abundance of caution, like the, guy's, the guy's blessed. His, the proclamation of him becoming um, blessed Bring, reintroduces him to hundreds of millions of people throughout the world who are going to hear about it. You know, it's like, I can imagine Sheen in heaven just being like how much he wants to give as a blessed in heaven in the power of his intercession, the rediscovery of his works. Um, it would it would cause a massive wave of grace throughout, especially our country, who's leaderless um, and gives a new weight to everything that he's done. I get more people to pray to him for miracles. So, to say that out of an abundance of caution, for what? Who's giving the orders here? How can you say that? We need him now more than ever. There's nothing holding him back, but out of an abundance of caution, we want to wait. That tells me, and this is really harsh, but it, here's, that communicates to me, the communion of saints are irrelevant. This is more of a trophy that at some point we'll put on him. Yeah, Rome's determine he's blessed. There's a miracle, a resurrection of a baby is the miracle that's approved. Yeah, he's a pretty powerful intercessor, but I have an abundance of caution. We're not, it goes unanswered. And that's why we have, you know, we started a movement with the petition and, you know, we, we've had rallies in a few places, um, but people just need to ask the Diocese of Peoria, why won't you proclaim it? Why won't you? The politics, the church politics are, are crazy, but I, I think I have to. I got to open a can of worms here. Okay, I'm going to step into the <laughs> deep into the of the controversy pool right now. I can't help myself, but I, I have to because it's all related. You know, when it comes to Fulton Sheen, um, when he was on William F. Buckley at the end, towards the end of his life, like I almost threw up in my mouth 
listening to him. I thought, what, what, what has happened to you? I feel like the politics and the, and the machine of the bureaucracy uh, that was against him kind of crushed him a little bit. But he was a loyal son of Holy Mother Church, and he refused to air the dirty laundry publicly. Do you think that's fair? Well, I understand why he did it. Um, you know, with the whole Cardinal Spellman thing, he kept under the rug uh, when he was, you know, the plug was pulled on that whole thing. And it ended basically his media career. Um, he certainly he wouldn't, he would certainly never find him criticizing a Pope, um, no matter what, really. No matter what. Uh, he would yeah. find some way to deal with, yeah, he he would find some way to, to, to like, his, his thing was, how do you address the errors? He would have found the creative way to address that. I have heard him criticize like Pope, even um, Gregory the Great once, just on a commentary on scripture. Um, but, you know, I, I think that that, especially during that time, I don't know. I, I <sighs> He was very cautious about ever passing judgment on, on any individual, even though he saw the writing on the wall of what was going on within within the church. Well, just like, like even his comments on. on the liturgy, for instance, even his comments on the, on the new mass, which was brand new pretty much uh, at that mm-hmm. time. And his, his embracing of like the guitar mass life team, uh, the, what would become the life team mass someday. Like it was like, you, you gotta be kidding me. This is a guy who loved mm-hmm. liturgy. This is a guy who, who was b- by ritual. Um, h- how do you go from that to acting like it, this is all okay. This it was schizophrenic, and and again, I look at it and I go, I, I feel like he got, he felt like tired and just like beat up because the machine had worn him down, and because of his loyalty, he simply wasn't going to rock that boat publicly. But behind the scenes, they set him up to fail. They tried to put him a, as a bishop in Rochester, knowing that there was going to be issues, and they wanted him to fail, and so that he would look, uh, he'd be embarrassed, and and his public persona would would be brought down. And that's part of the reason why they're not uh, moving his cause forward because of all of that, which wasn't his fault. I mean, it's just, I don't know. A lot of a lot of Catholics like myself see that last interview and they just shake their heads and go, what happened to such a great and incredible Catholic saint of our time? And they, and they just wonder whether or not he was questioning things towards the end of, uh, end of his life. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. Um I don't know his comments on the the liturgy that you're mentioning. I would be interested to see to see them. Um, yeah, William F. Buckley. I know you, you should Google it. I, I mean, it's, I've I've seen that. It's been a long time, so I need to re, just revisit it. Um, but I I don't believe that though any of those are reasons at all for why there's a delay. I believe the delay or the the pause, whatever you want to call it, you know, maybe some even trying to ice it um, is strictly because of what Sheen represents, though, to um, two Catholics in the United States, two bishops, two priests, and what he really has to offer and what he in himself as his own example um, means to them. I think he's, he stands sort of as a judgment against many uh, of the clerics today within within the church. Um, I think that that is what has been holding him back. And I think it's only a few figures that have been responsible. And I think that list is getting smaller um, as far as who's really holding on to um, to keeping this from moving forward. Um, and that's why I think in the end, it, this wasn't at the very end of his life, but it was, I think, in 72, where he then – in his famous speech out in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, um, of who's going to save the church. He said, it's not going to be us bishops and priests and religious. It's going to be you, the people. You have the, you know, the eyes, the ears, and the minds to save the church. And it's your job, your responsibility. It's a job. You're your responsibility to make sure your priests act like precepts, your bishops act like bishops. And that's kind of been the torch that's been passed on, but it can also be done in the wrong spirit. Is this this we live in very interesting times, um, where Sheen sometimes for people is a convenient hero, and then other times they will malign him in, in something else. Um, and I, I think he he, 
everything he's said and done, like even like with the interview that you mentioned too, everything he's done is out in the open. So it's not kind of much to figure out. Um, but I think in the end, I think his autobiography is really his last word. That's his way to do it unfiltered without anybody there. And, you know, for somebody who said it's always kind of strange for someone to write their own, you know, a saint to write their own um, autobiography. Now he didn't consider himself a saint, but I'm so glad that he did because it gave us his unfiltered last thoughts and words on everything. I think that we need to take with him because, um, you know, Fulton Sheen obviously wasn't perfect. And right. I've also read a lot of different things and I've seen accusations of him like caving into things that he fundamentally stood for as in his entire life. Um, you know, creating him as being like a theistic evolutionist, which is, that's like saying St. Thomas was a Platonist by the time he died. <laughs> um, right. it, it's just unreal, but you know, it is what it is. I mean, everybody's going to be up for scrutiny and, I think that Sheen tried to find where the spirit was trying to work. He said after the council, he said if there wasn't a storm after the council, you'd actually have to question whether the Holy Spirit was present because of the times in which we lived. Now, one can take that any way they want. Um, And I think that Sheen represents, I really think, the the overall Catholic. He, He died at a time where just when all the poison was beginning to spell its, you know, to, to show its faces in all these different places. He dies then in 79. And, you know, you and I grew up right after that, you know, and we still hear the same songs and all of that. If Sheen were around in the eighties and nineties, um, what, what would he have done when he would have seen that? Would he have begun to work on a reform of the reform? We'll never know. So I am always cautious to say, well, that's like, that's where Sheen was because he was trying to find, you know, where the Holy Spirit was working in this versus many will just throw everything out since the council. They won't say it, but they'll basically say the Holy Spirit was vacant at the council. And then you open up a whole can of worms when you start doing that, because then, you you know, then ultimately you're going to question every pope during the council, after the council, John Paul II, and then the adifications, canonizations. And, and I've, I've read all, you know, like you, you know, we're, we're exposed to all of these uh, critiques, but I find danger that can be within there where Sheen, I think, was always smart in siding with, and I have many saints would do this, St. Ignatius would do this to an extreme, but you would side with where the church is and reject those things that clearly are uh, contrary, but those are usually interpretations or people take something and they make it seem like it. What it really is, is something else. And we've never really had a chance to experience you know, even some of the basic things, whether it be the Novus Ordo Mass being said right. I lived in Rome. I've experienced that beautifully in Latin, auto orientum. I've seen those things. We can debate all day all day long about the changes that were made, um, but um, it will work itself out. It's hard that there's casualties along the way. But we are, like we've mentioned, we are living in unprecedented times and the culmination of infiltration. And this is where humble theologians who are prayerful, like Sheen, who make a holy hour every day, can have confidence, you know, living what Our Lady said, you can have greater confidence that you're going to have clarity and simplicity in the midst of this versus intellectuals who want to overcomplicate it to the point where people don't even... They, they just doubt everything, including the church itself. And in the name of defending the church, they actually have excommunicated themselves and made themselves their own magisterium. And I've seen that too often with, quote unquote, you know, conservatives, this, all these labels, trads, whatever. Like, you're Catholic or you're not. Amen. And we got to understand what is what is and what isn't. And I think that's our battle. And this, you, you and me you know, on the front lines of these things. I think Sheen's the example. And where he might have not been strong in something, well, we need to be strong. And that's why, you know, there is a, we started the Institute is to continue that today because he was a humble man. And I think, you know, he, he definitely would, he knew how to adjust, but these are uncharted territory, right? And we're, we're the ones left in it to help, you know, steer things. Yeah. Alberto, our friend from UK, says he was about eight when Fulton Sheen died and he's trying to guess my age. I was five. I was five in 79. 
So uh, I was I was already practically paying taxes by that point. So old. Uh, I don't recommend getting old, by the way. Jeff Burrier, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out. My friend from San Antonio, uh, Christine asks the question. Christine OFS, welcome back. Good morning. About Venerable Sheen, I'm not sure if I'm correct, but didn't Rome last year say there was a flaw using a sexual scandal, possibly something to that effect, which has no basis? Again, I'm not sure. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Haber, wasn't it that um, because he was the bishop of Rochester and there was a sexual scandal in the diocese, the question was, and there was a report that was going to be released about his involvement, what he did or didn't know, or what he did or didn't do with the priests that are involved. But again, he was set up. They put him there hoping he would fail. They put him there knowing there were there were issues brewing there, and he had never been a bishop of a diocese he'd never managed a diocese or a chancery or a bunch of unruly priests or a bunch of unruly lay folk like us so his job was never that and he he would be a little bit out of his element administration was wasn't his wasn't his strengths and they put him in they put him in weakness rather than his strengths hoping he would fail i would say that that's what happened what would you say yeah, well, basically, uh, in the Diocese of Peoria, I mean, they, these things, the questions were all known um, way before, even back in before his uh, his beatification was cleared. Um, yeah, during the time he was Bishop of Rochester, was it 66 to 69, I think, um, there were two priests before he even got in who, were, I guess, had questions of misconduct. And so the question really was, was how were they handled under, under Sheen once he was there? And the the Diocese of Peoria already knew what they were because they tried to use this as an excuse when they paused the cause, um, the beatification mass, and say, well, maybe there's a couple of questions. But I talked personally with the Diocese of Peoria, with their canon lawyer. I mean, they they were so meticulous. They did overkill on – there was like one or two questions regarding, I guess, these, these how he handled these. Not only was it handled sufficiently the first time, but when um, it was started to come up again, they had already then they pr- basically produced like another dossier and presented it to Rome. Rome was more than satisfied; they were satisfied the first time. So nothing's come up like in the last year. Anything that's happened really since 2019 has been smoke and mirrors of making people think that there's something important about a secular report out of New York. That's really right. all it is. It's smoke and mirrors, and the faster we call yeah. that out, um, then the Diocese of Peoria is going to have to. They're going to have to do something. Are they? They look. Then it's clearly a cover up because all you have to do is schedule a mass. Who cares about all the pomp and ceremony? We're in a we're in a war right now, and like like Alan said, like she, machine. There's, unless souls are saved, nothing is saved. The beatification about Fulton Sheen is about saving a lot of souls. Does that not matter to you? Do we have to worry about having this thing built or that thing built or rescheduling this and the right venue? It's absolutely absurd. So that's what we're stuck with. What about uh, – because Don Franco, good morning to you, Don. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Praise be to God. Um, Over on Facebook, Don asks a question about Fulton Sheen. Did he ever bilocate? Which made me think – Hey, what do we know about Fulton Sheen when it comes to sort of uh, like like Padre Pio who bilocated or had the stigmata or had the incense, the air of sanctity? People, uh, you know, many, many stories of the smell of roses, even when he was bilocating, for instance. So is there anything Mm. like that in Fulton Sheen that is maybe not as well known? That's a good question. I'm I'm not aware of any reports of him. What about incorrupt – is his body incorrupt? We don't know. Interesting question, though, because I, I spoke with a woman um, who's a doctor. She's in Florida. She's been involved in various cases of incorruptibility. One was uh, Kateri Tekawitha, or as she was presented, it should be pronounced Kateri, if you do. Anyway, but she was involved in that. Uh, she's been involved in other ones, and she has an interest in Sheen. She, based off of this, this is actually from a scientific perspective of things. And, and I really want to bring her on to my podcast to interview her about this because I've never heard anything like this. But she was making a connection biologically and spiritually to things of incorruptibles that blew my mind. And mm. I can't quite repeat them. It's been a couple of years now. 
But um, anyway, she thinks he is incorruptible. But the only way we're going to find out is let's beatify him. And then they'll start obviously getting relics and they'll find out right away. So, and imagine, maybe that's another thing. Imagine if he's incorruptible and they don't even want that to even be a possibility because what that would mean for Sheen. And then once again, right. what, he, what he was as a bishop, as a priest and everything that we want and need him for, boom, there it is. So you can see that the devil, I believe, is strongly at work to prevent any of this surely, from happening. Though, surely the Diocese of Peoria already knows the answer to this question. I don't know if they do. I mean, his Surely body they, was when taken they trans, out when they, of... It took them forever to get the body because New York, you know, dragged their feet on that and refused to give it up and they had to go to court over the deal. But when they finally got the body, surely they they looked, right? I mean, how could they not? I'd have to see. I'd have to... Uh, Alan, and maybe Alan Smith knows the answer. My understanding is that they haven't looked. It, once Once the court, the final court case was won in New York for the Supreme Court... The transition of the body was extremely fast. You know, all this hold up that was like, oh, this is a big deal. It was like in the dead of night. It's like a, like a show. In the dead of night, they remove him unceremoniously, you know, and then put him in a vehicle. And then he's transported all the way out to Peoria, who's waiting for him. And basically, almost immediately, they just bring him right into the spot where he is now. I'm not aware of anything in between of somebody, you know, lifting it up and seeing. Maybe somebody did. Um Alan may have the answer to that. Uh, I'm not aware. Yeah. Nobody's mentioned it to me because I've asked that question and nobody seems to have the answer. And I love the fact that we're finding incorruptibles even in these times. Of course, Sister Wilhelmina is being talked about in the chat box right now. Then there was that uh, Armenian, wasn't he? He was an Armenian cardinal that they mm -hmm. that got reported. Was it last week, week before? They discovered him to be incorruptible. I love that. So, how amazing mm -hmm. would it be? If uh, Fulton Sheen uh, was incorruptible, that would be just absolutely. It would rock the world. God. I mean, yeah, it really would, um, and it would be a great sign of hope. I think uh, for yeah. so many, I really think he's the he's the General MacArthur that the church needs right now, especially in in the U.S. Um, I mean, uh, MacArthur, who he knew personally. I mean, as you know, if you probably, I'm sure you have probably have an interest in military history. I mean, that, that man was unbelievable. Like he would have, if we let him kept, keep going, it would have been a, a very different world. Yeah. <laughs> Getting excited here. But General MacArthur took a holy hour every day as well. Not necessarily in front of the Blessed Sacrament, but he also made an hour of prayer every day because he said he couldn't go into battle until he did that. So now you're triggering me. And we're, we're going to run out of time here in eight minutes. But uh, man, <laughs> um, off. I just gave I just gave a talk in New Hampshire at the FSSP parish up there about uh, Joseph Muller, Joseph Muller, Joey Ox from uh, the book Church of Spies, which is sitting over here. And, uh, you know, one of the points I made towards the end of the talk, you know, unfortunately, I didn't have more time is just how things how things progressed so rapidly after after the fall of Nazis in, in Europe, the OSS becomes the CIA. The CIA or mm -hmm. OSS during the war was in bed with the mafia because the enemy of my enemy is my friend and the enemy of fascism was the mafia. So the mafia helps the OSS do all kinds of things during the campaign to take Italy. Well, when the war ends, that relationship doesn't end. So the OSS that becomes CIA is still doing business with the, with the mafia and they needed they needed their help, uh, the help from their friends at the Vatican to continue down this road with fighting communism. So this, the pendulum swung so far when it came, when it comes to the world, the flesh and the devil, communism was the enemy and, um, and the politics, the geopolitics involved. And they, 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 they took advantage of people like Montini, uh, who became uh, Pope Paul the sixth and others or not. Hold on. Roncalli was John, John the 23rd and Montini was Pope Paul the sixth. Mm -hmm. These people were involved in the spy ring set up under Pius the Twelfth, as, as stipulated in um, Church of Spies. So when you look at that and you think, man, the shenanigans, the infiltration, the craziness, the, the connections, it's all right there. And then you think back, you talk about MacArthur or even um, General Patton, who was not Catholic. General Patton, he wanted to go to Berlin. He wanted to go all the way to Moscow, but they shut him down. 
Like, he was not allowed. So MacArthur, you get to you get to the Korean War. MacArthur was like, I want to play to win. And they're like, no. They shut him down. Why? Because it's not in the best geopolitical interest of the powers that be in the deep state and in the in the uh, intelligence apparatus to to play to win because then the game is over. We got to extend this thing. This party needs to continue on. And we've been seeing that ever since. And I got to tell you, boy, it just it, it. I don't know. It makes my mind. I would say blown or numb, but it really just angers me, to be honest with you, because you feel like a pawn in someone else's game. And then you go, but now let me loop back to Fulton Sheen. I've often thought when I thought about Fulton Sheen and praying and asking for his intercession and praying for his canonization that God will not be mocked. The devil, the enemies and his, the, his friends on, in this world, whether they wear collars or miters or what have you, pectoral crosses, whatever it might be, they uh, they can they can they can intend for evil, but God will flip it on its head and use it for good. If God wants Fulton Sheen to be a saint, who can stop God? Literally, no one. So they can do whatever they want. They can play all the games they want, but at the end of the day, God wins. So um, I don't think Fulton Sheen's concerned about it, and I, I don't think we ought to be either uh, about it because at the end of the day, God wins, and God's going to get whatever He wants. And um, and so God's timing and God's will be done when it comes to the canonization mm-hmm. of Fulton Sheen. I just think what we ought to do is not put our head in the sand and pretend like everything is okay. We should we should be sober and honest about things, but then trust in God. Would you say that that's fair? Yeah, I do. I think that's exactly what it is. I mean, when it comes to graces, there's a lot of things. Uh, even St. Thomas talks about this. Is There's graces that God gives us just gratuitously all the time, millions and millions of graces. And there's other graces that he gives on condition that we ask for them. And I remember Fulton Sheen giving a story of a woman, and a, a husband and a wife, and she's, her husband was going to go out. And he says, well, look, um, I'm going to go over there. She's like, well, don't you want to bring your gun? And he says, no, no, because if, uh, if I'm meant to die, then my gun won't matter. She said, well, what if you survive on condition that you bring your gun? And I think a lot of the, the graces and things of today are conditioned because God works out of cooperation um, with humanity. And there's things that happen in, uh, in the midst of the things that we fight for. And, and within the church's history, there's been saints who have done that. Um, you know, imagine if Catherine of Siena didn't go out there and, 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 and tell the Pope, get back to Rome. Something that might seem a little simple or kind of funny from a you know, historical point of view. Like she was a bold woman who, you know, that changed history. That mark, you know, it's the ripple effect that happens. And there's certain th- things right now in condition that we do it. So we, um, so sometimes Catholics fall into almost a quietism of, well, we know who wins in the end, but I certainly don't want. You don't know if you're going to be a casualty. There's going to be a lot of casualties in the midst of that. Do you have a do you have a certificate that says you're not one of them? I don't. I don't even know when I'm going to die. So it is the you know the fear and trembling. But I also think that when you draw close to the Lord, He puts His desires on your heart. Be faithful to the church, and you and God's kingdom is a kingdom, and it needs to be fought for like anything else with all the the, the kinds of spiritual weapons, intellectual. Um, that we have at our disposal because God wants a, he wants a clean house and what's to come, you know, is going to be for those who fought for it. There won't be anybody who, you know, there's not going to be anybody anybody on the sidelines who makes it through what's coming. We have to be all in. Like Sheen says, at least make a daily holy hour um, because we have to do some kind of commensurate sacrifice or we're not worthy. As he says, to salute the same flag. So we have a lot of work to do. But it has to be backed by prayer. And, yeah, you know, there's unfortunately battles that have to be fought. And it'll be in the end, it'll be good for the church. We just have to do it with the right spirit that's behind yeah. it. I mean, Amen. virtues as well as, of course, the Holy Spirit. Like you said, God will get his way um, in the end. He does. And uh, millstones are made for certain things, for such things as uh, as Linda says. Yeah, or yeah, Linda pointed that millstones are being formed. Yes, they are. Antonia says, you are right, Dr. Peter. Well, you heard it here first, folks. Uh, you are right. John says, Archbishop Fulton Sheen had an, uh, what is that? What is that? Acerbic temper? He did not stand for any new age hippie nonsense or any disrespectful behavior. 
uh, at the altar or anywhere in the church. You might want to go watch that video of him with uh, uh, William Buckley. He seemed to embrace, and I want to be wrong, trust me when I tell you, but he seemed to embrace a little bit of hippy-dippy guitar folk mass, and it's just like, what are you saying? Someone needs to wake him up. Anyway, uh, by the way, uh, Don Franco says, Venerable Maria Bagrida is incorrupt and bilocated, and Apoch Gabriel says, I'm waiting for Venerable Mary of Agrita to be canonized as saint. We are too. Dr. Howard, once again, thank you for your time. Loved having you on. God bless you and God love you.